Every you temperature checks on people because you have to, right? You don't get that continuity and you just wait until like they decide to break up with you one day. And you're like, oh, wait, what happened? Why? Thought you were, you said you were happy. You just said you were happy. Exactly. That's happy. happened to people too. <laughs> I'm not happy. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Dev Interrupted. I'm your host, Dan Lines, and today I'm joined by Carolyn Vo, partner and head of engineering at Oliver Wyman. Carolyn, welcome to the show. Dan, thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome to have you here. Would love to start out by giving our audience the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, your career? Sure. So currently I'm a partner at Henry of Engineering, as you announced, but that was never in my, ever in my sphere of what I want to do. You know, engineer goes, I want to be a partner at a management consulting firm, right? So my career has been interesting. I've just kind of found my own way. Started off as an intern at Silicon Graphics way back in the day. I think I just dated myself and then just kind of went along with the flow of whatever I felt like I wanted to do. Cause I think most people go take that trajectory upwards. And if you go backwards, right. Then you're just a failure. But I just kind of was like, some days I was like, I think I'm ready to go back to engineering and I would do that. And some days I'd be like, you know, I think I'm ready for like a management kind of role. And I do that. So my career path has been a little bit just kind of weird in the, in the unconventional way. Yeah. Cause sometimes I wanted to go back to be a maker. Sometimes I wanted to, to, to go to leadership roles. And then I found this opportunity as actually a contractor when I decided to embark on my contractor freelance life, because you get to choose what you want to do for how long, right? You're going to choose what technology you're going to work on. So that was appealing to me. But the next thing I know, I'm like, wait, what started off as three months turned into now it's like over 10 years I've been at the firm, which is kind of crazy to be honest with you. Never been anywhere that long, but I think that's a good sign where I just, I honestly have not been just like, keeping track of the time because I just feel like there's so much cool stuff going on. Yeah, I saw that you have an awesome background, you know, computer science background, software engineer, saw you doing some stuff with like C sharp, possibly Microsoft stack. And then yeah. I see you going a little bit back and forth, like you said, like team leader, maybe hands on team leader, manager, engineer, and then, you know, where, where you are today. Um, is there anything that happened to you when you were kind of going back and forth between like maker? manager like uh how did you decide or like what what would make you want to do the the two different sides i felt like it was a combination of things it's a really good question it was like what did i just feel ready for my gut was just like okay i'm bored of working on the 50th you know jira ticket for the same product i've been working on for like x months or years and it was like what do i want to do next you can always choose a different project but it's still more the same you want to change the subject matter and you just get kind of bored with the things you're doing the technologies you're working on and the nice thing about technology is that there's so many different things you can work on, right? The tools, the technologies, languages, platforms. Why would I want to stick to doing Java, which I started with in my career and do that until I die? Some people, that's great. They like that. They want to be a, a deep master in something. But for me, I'm like, Java came out, you know, the dynamic framework switched to that. And then switching over to like JavaScript technologies. And interestingly enough, you know, .NET Core is interesting and out and doing some great stuff. I mean, you've got like Python. So like for me, Maybe it's a little bit of like, just the, not the FOMO, it's just like that. I want to try something different and new. And I would go with the flow with whatever I, I saw was out there and like whatever opportunities existed from the, my network. Like it was interesting. Like a lot of jobs that I found just by talking to people like, Hey, what, what do you know? Who's looking for this? That's awesome. Yeah. Change is good. Don't be afraid to try different roles. I love yeah. it. Now our first topic is around what well, we're going to call it the art of retention. But it's around retention in engineering organizations specifically, and it could be obvious, but I think it'd be cool to start out with why is retention important in the software industry or for engineering leaders? It's critical. It's not even important. It's critical because if you want to do some substantial things, right, you got to keep people, especially the great people around. You can't get any, any traction if you're just stopping and starting all the time, right? Onboarding people takes a long time. I mean, people, I think sometimes make the mistake of assuming, oh, I'll hire some people and then they can get, they can pick up where we left off. There's acclimation to your culture. That's a, that's another onboarding right consideration. There's learning the technologies and they don't happen to know it. And keeping good people around also is testament to your culture. I feel like 
you can tell that story when you're recruiting for people like, yeah, like, you know, I know the great resignation has been happening, but I haven't lost many people at all. I'm proud of that. And that tells other people who want to come out yeah. there, wow, something good must be going on here. Not, they're not just fleeing like rats from a burning ship, right? So retention is just good for so many yeah. different reasons. It helps your company get some, some traction in what you want to do. It helps other people feel like there's not something funky and weird going on too. Well, like I know the average number of years people stay at a company is like three to five years, but we've had people who stay a lot longer. Again, people are just happy. And so the trick is to figure out what keeps people happy and motivated. But that's different from asking that question, are you happy? Which we can delve into. And I might rant about like 20 minutes, but I won't hold myself back. Oh yeah, we're we're gonna go there next. I was thinking about the, cause I, the question that I just asked you, I asked myself like, okay, why, why is retention important? Yeah. And it is obvious. I think in all areas of business, retention is important. So I started out on the engineering side. I've done some things on the go to market side and it's different. I think for, for engineering, that's what I would say on the go to market side, obviously retention is also important, but I'm going to double down on it and, and the end in the engineering side. And the word that came to my mind was continuity. Yeah. When you're creating something, you're build, these are builders. We, we, we are creators. We're building products. The continuity of that creative team matters so much. And when your people are going and coming in, if there's a lot of churn, it's hard to keep momentum and therefore hard to keep continuity. So that's what yeah. came to mind to me. Super, super important. And that's why I'm so happy. We're talking about it today and you led us to the next place that we're going. You said something like asking engineers, are you happy? So asking them that question, it's kind of a garbage question. Yeah. I love it's, that. It's fluffy. It doesn't get you yeah. any insights. That's to mention, I've seen it be ineffective in person. So what I feel like, are you happy? It doesn't hit upon on our real reasons underlying why you are satisfied with your job, your role, responsibilities, et cetera, right? What your motivating factors. It doesn't give me insights into like your work-life balance um, and work-life quality requirements that you have. It doesn't give me insights into, are we doing our part as an organization supporting you? It's just like, are you happy? You can be happy in your personal life, but you can be like, eh, about your work life. And that was happening with one of my engineers, actually. We do temperature checks on people. Cause you have to, right? You don't get that continuity and you just wait until like they decide to break up with you one day. You're like, oh, wait, what happened? Why? Not your I thing. thought you, you said you were happy. You just said you were happy. Exactly. That's happy. happened to yeah. people too. I'm, 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 I'm happy. Cause like, you remember the dynamic you have with your line manager or your career advisor, whoever is managing your staff and asking you that question. If you don't feel like you like them, know them, trust them, you don't have that relationship. You might feel like they're more senior. They might have like a blowback situation you feel like you say i'm not happy you might be worried it might impact your career right some people are not comfortable being honest as well so not only is the question garbage because you're not getting to the meat of stuff because you're not exploring the other side of the coin where it's like can i get them to be honest and forthcoming with pointed questions it's just like i feel like people would pat themselves on the back by asking the question i did my job as a manager i, I asked if they're happy they're happy they're not a flight risk they said they're happy it's goofy. It doesn't get to the mood. Mm. Right. So what do you think is, what's a better way? Cause you know, we're, it, it's good if you're having a temperature check or saying it's not good if you're just asking, are you, are you happy? But at least you're checking in. But now that I'm checking in, what's a better way or a better set of questions that we can ask to get to the meat of it? I think you can have different approaches to get into the meat. So depending on when, at what point you're touch pointing with that person. If you're doing like a, a quarterly checkup, you know, you can say, hi, how are your, your quarterly objectives going? If you're doing it based on a more transactional kind of conversation. Not that transactional is bad, by the way. It's just like, if they have big objectives for the year, you want to make sure that they're tracking well. You don't want to wait to ask those questions. How are you tracking your objectives? If it's like November and you have a year in review December, that point's too late to pivot. You can also ask just like questions like, how does this week go for you? One thing I like to do for my um, advisees I ask them two questions. I say, what was one good thing that happened this week for you? And what was one challenging thing that happened this week for you? And it can be personal. It can be work-related. It doesn't matter. But those can be interesting, just initial prompting questions, just to see how things are really going that get you to give you some kind of a signal of where to poke around next further, right? Absolutely. One of the things that I've found when talking with engineers 
and not just asking, are you happy? I usually try to say something like, um, what did you create this week? Or what did you release this week? Did anything that you did get into production, for example, or did you get Let's something merged? Can I scale this? And <laughs> you know, when you start asking an engineer, something like that, two things will happen. If things are going well, they'll say, yeah, I just got, you know, I got this thing I've been working on merge. I was working on it the last two weeks. So pumped that it got reviewed and it's in, and it's actually releasing tomorrow. And yeah, that feel, it feels awesome. That's like one, one side, but usually it's not that perfect and something will come up. They'll say, yeah, I've been working on this one thing. I put up like a, a pull request review, but then it got like bashed down. And now I'm like down in the dumps. Like people are saying like, it, it wasn't so good. So now I'm trying to figure out what to do. Okay. Now we're getting to the meat. Are you, if yep. you're happy or not, not happy. Right. Yeah. You get into exactly. the, and, and one of the things that, you know, we talk about a lot at linear B. So within, within my company is this concept of continuous merge. And if engineers are able to merge their code continuously, keep, keep that good, healthy pattern happening of I'm building something and I'm actually seeing it, you know, get through that correlates with happiness. And what I wanted to, to ask you is maybe there's some misconceptions of what makes an engineer happy or what, what engineers yeah. really want. Do you think there's some common misconceptions that you've seen? I think there are, I think it depends on the organization you work for and what their primary objectives are, right? What their business model is, and they'll make assumptions about what the engineers are there for. And they'll also make assumptions about what engineers want both. And some of the misconceptions I know are like engineers want to move into manager role, want to get promoted. No, some people want to stay very close to the doing. They want to just stay very hands-on and they want to move more laterally around technologies, but they don't want to move and progress upwards, upwards in terms of like management and leadership. They just, they just want to tinker. They just want to code all day. They just want to play with the next thing. So sometimes you'll see people yeah. get promoted and they're like, wait, why are you not happy? You got to be happy on promoted. People are like, no, I don't my hands on it as much as anymore. And it makes them sad. Yeah. Right. I had that when I was kind of in an up and coming startup, like a junior team leader and some of the people that I would report into, not all of them were engineers because it's, you know, small company. Sometimes you're reporting into the CEO or maybe a non-technical person. Yeah. And I actually made a mistake. I remember some of these early conversations, they'll say, oh, how is this person performing? An engineer, I'd say, oh, they're doing awesome. <laughs> like they just did this like refactor of the code or they released a new feature. They're totally pumped. And that person would say, well, we're growing. What do you think about the promotion to another like team leader for this person? And I was like, okay, yeah. I mean, I would pump them up, right? That makes sense. Let me promote them. But it's like the wrong move because that person actually wanted more hands-on responsibility, not people management. And so yeah. that's like a, a really, that's a hard lesson. It's a messed up situation. You think you're doing something good for them. You're not. <laughs> I know, but you know, you, yeah. you had already. So. Reasons why you want to do it. Like, again, like you think, oh, that person wants it. But yeah, again, that, that kind of bleeds in that what's next story is why it gave me like that idea to have that. Because when you have an engineer who just loves just be like hands on keyboard, part of them dies inside the minute you make them away from the hands on keyboard parts of their job. It's just like, it's just terrible. And then they'll quit and go somewhere else, you know? Yeah. You have. So you actually kind of label this, like what's next story. Can you break down what that means for us? Yeah. So what I found stemming from one of the things stemming from the whole, are you happy thing? Yeah. Just, it's not, it's not a good prompting question, right? You gave me some maybe awesome prompting questions you ask because it gets you to the meat. So the what's next story, I'm always asking people like, what do you want to do next? And it just made me realize, you know what, there could be something I can just anchor around a theme for everybody I talk to. What's next for you, right? Short term, long term. What's your what's next story? It, and, and there are dimensions around what's next for people. They think just in terms of maybe projects. I'm like, guys, think beyond that, right? Think beyond what projects you want to work on next. Think about who you want to work with next. Think about who you want to learn from next, right? When you get paired up on a project. Think about who you want to mentor next. Think about what technologies you want to work on. You know, like the, the dimensions are so wide and vast. So like 
The What's Next Story Inc. is around these multiple different considerations that are just acting honestly as prompts to get people to think about things in a way that maybe weren't thinking about it before. When you ask that question to an individual contributor engineer, what types of responses do you get? Oh, plenty. I get like the things like, I want to work with so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so next. I want to work more in this cloud vendors platform. I want to play with this cloud service next. I want to work with these data stores next. Um, I want to work more with like PWAs and, and native apps. You know, you get like a, a wide variety of things from people that are the strong ICs, right? They just want to get slightly close to the doing. And those are all related to things around them learning more around the things that they want to do more of. Yeah. So it's kind of like it, you'll get a wide range of responses. Some of the responses were, were more technical, like, Hey, I want to work with this technology or this framework or this. Okay. You know, I might be thinking, all right, even if it's a junior person, maybe this person's like going down more of like a CTO path or an architect type path. This is like, keep talking about technologies or maybe like service design. Then you mentioned another one. Someone, someone said something to you, like, I want to work with these people. Yeah. That's more like, to me, like collaboration, maybe creator possi possibly. So it's like, I like that on the, what story next is it kind of gives you a little bit of a lens into how you could guide them from a career perspective. It seems. Exactly. And it helps them frame. I find otherwise in the past when I would just have like a what are your objectives for the year? It's just so open-ended. Sometimes it's just, it almost seems overwhelming. So if you give them some kind of structure, right, to help them frame around what they want to end their year with, it's much more helpful. And, and nothing's wrong with those prompting questions. Those are just, you know, you come up with your own, but yeah, it helps just people think about how they want to land the year in their own development, opportunities they want to get involved in, you know, exposure they want to get to other people and other teams and other colleagues or whatever. It's just like, so many considerations are so vast. So you want to make sure that they at least are asked about those. So even if they don't care about them, that's not as important to me. I just care about, you know, things like this. So yeah, like you said, the contributor, but you're still maybe yeah. people that want to go more collaborative in a different way. And they want to go maybe towards a different career trajectory, move away from the hands-on. Like we have paths for people that let you go from being a maker into um, a tech leader and then eventually a tech advisor. So you can make it to that path to partner. Some people have expressed interest. They're like, okay, well, I didn't know that you can become a partner as an engineer. Now that I know you can do it, like that, I want to, can we talk about how that could work? Right? Yeah. Good so way to retain people. Uh, absolutely. Hey, here's because the path for you. One track. Exactly. So you ask the what's next questions that are just, again, initial prompts, but then you just further deep dive down the rabbit hole. And then, cause what you, if you pay attention to the answers, it'll give you more insights and more signals about how to double click more to certain other things they might be thinking of that, you know, could get them to that better answer what they want to do next. As a head of engineering, when you're kind of putting that lead more of like the leadership or like executive style hat on, when it comes to retaining your engineering team, do you have a framework that you're using or is it a little more just loose with like, Hey, let's make sure we're having these conversations. It's a little bit more loose because what I've found about working at the management consulting firm that I work at. It feels like very entrepreneurial. So things are not at all like set in stone. We're literally making up new disciplines in our org. Like we just built out like a human insights capability. It's awesome. I love it. So we're very fluid in what we do in terms of what disciplines we build out as well as the tracks for people. And there's no framework because I feel like as things are fluid, because we're open, because if I have a conversation with an engineer that makes me go, oh, we didn't think about providing that kind of track or that kind of role responsibility for that person before. You know, I feel like it's just, it's about those good prompting questions and those regular conversations you have so that you can get to, to help you figure out what, what, what's best for people. For me, again, I've always different, right? But that's just not what I've experienced working here. I mean, you need to be flexible yeah. uh, to the different types of people. Sounds like you have a lot of like project change going on and totally makes sense to me. The thing with retention or something that obviously impacts retention is culture. You've said a culture of tinkering and fun is important. What do you mean by that? The fun part, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm cracking up because I'm just thinking about engineers are, we're fun, right? We like to do things like put Easter eggs in the software for a reason, for God's sakes, right? 
like the first Easter egg I ever put in, I won't say what it was for. Um, it was just hilarious. It was so goofy. It was like, it took me about like, you gotta tell us 20 what minutes. It, it was for an internal us. application, but it was right. like, it was, it took me 20 minutes and I just made it. So if you clicked 15 times over a certain letter on a label in the screen, it would launch a, an animated monkey going quick monkey around. It was the dumbest thing, but it was so fun. And I showed people they're like, that's awesome. Anyway, the fun part, so I'm saying, you gotta make sure you have, uh, you enable people to have some fun. Like whether it's doing things like goofy things like Easter eggs, or if it's just things like, like today, we're going to have uh, a few minutes before our, our engineering call, we're going to just play family feud. You gotta just be spontaneous and not be rigid in what you do you, in, the, in the tinkering part too. It's so important. Engineers like to do things with technology. Some people like to build, some people like to provide advisory, right? But you, for the people that love to build, tinkering is essential. Like I said, or else they die inside. Like they want to be able to play with something. So you have to give them that safe space and that permission and time to go off and do things, whether it's tinkering with a technology that's strategic to what you need in the organization versus having kinds of time to go off and like really think over something random, like, Hey, I want to go and build something with some raspberry pies. You know, we're builders by nature. Yeah. I, I love it. I think it's super important. I really love what you're saying about the Easter egg thing. Yeah, maybe and it's actually maybe, in, <laughs> no, I, I love it. I have my own Easter egg story, <laughs> but I think it's important to encourage it because like you're saying that it's, it's fun. It's funny. The whole, whole team gets involved. It's also related to like coding and building. So we had a sales engineer. His name was Eric. This is at my last company. His name was Eric and he's sales engineer. So he was like pretty close to the engineering team. And you know, he had a great personality, lively personality, but there was always like a little bit of a ten tension because Oftentimes when he would come to us, sometimes there'd be a bug in what we were building, right? I'm a sales engineer. Hey, I, I stumbled across this thing with a prospect. Is it supposed to work this way or not? And my team, I was a director at the time. My team was delivering a, a feature that he really wanted to help his sales organization. And he came storming down the stairs one day and said, Something like uh, weird because we were working on the first floor. Sales was on the second floor. He said something like, uh, hey, I thought you, you all said, you guys said that this feature was released. I was just like, you know, exploring the application. I have a call coming up in 15 minutes and I don't see it. And, you know, he was just having maybe like a, a confusing day because the feature was right there on the screen. So all the engineers was like, Eric, like, you know, turn their screens. Like it's right here. This is, <laughs> can, can't you see it here? And he was like, oh shit, you know, I, I missed it. Sorry guys. So he was coming down like kind of in an intense mode saying you messed up and, we and everyone's like, you didn't miss it. And so the, the guys came to me and said, can we do an Easter egg for Eric? What we want to do, cause they could tell when Eric was logging into the application. So it said like anytime Eric covers his mouse over the feature, it's going to have these huge animations of like sparkles and fireworks and this kind of thing. So I was like, yeah, do it. Awesome. So amazing. You know, yeah, that's the kind of stuff I feel like as a leader, like in that situation, you could say two things. You could say like, no, don't do it. Let's not waste our time on, on this. Or you could amplify and say, yeah. yes, like let's drop what we're doing right now and do this. That's what I did. And I think the whole team like appreciates that. Okay. This is a culture that I can have fun in. We can do cool stuff. We can put Easter eggs into the product leadership is backing us to like a, you know, it's yeah. going to take them like an hour or less to do this. Who cares? It's funny. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, I'm so glad you talked about it. I'm so glad. I would love how we stumbled upon the Easter egg, but like, it's such a weird little nuance of cultural, like augmentation, right? Where if you were not a technical person, an engineer yourself, right? You would have been like, no guys, don't do that. Risk averse, whatever. But Engineers need to look to leaders who are also engineers and you know, you, you set the vibe because you're one of them and the culture has to be one that's around like engineers being feel like, feeling like the, they're led by engineers. You know what I mean? And that's just what you do as an engineer. I'm sorry. I used to write, like, you made me laugh again because I did also a separate Easter egg around login too, because this other, anyway, we're going to buy Easter eggs in a different segment. That's like a whole other <laughs> podcast. I feel like, 
the Easter egg pod. <laughs> yeah. It's only Easter eggs. You got to say what you did. Um, do you think that this type of culture can come top down? Is it like a thing that leaders can make happen or is it more like who you hire the developers are, are the ones creating the culture? Like, how do you view that top down bottom up influence? It's kind of both and not from the top down perspective, like you think where it's like a mandate, no one is going to mandate fun. This isn't North Korea, right? It's like, but when you're a leader, like you are right, you are setting the tone because you're, like I said, you're like, yeah, let's go put those Easter eggs in guys. So it does help to have leadership at the top, set the tone absolutely from the top. Because people will see what they, they can do and what they're allowed to do and what they're like a little creative freedom to do. It comes from the bottom up as well, because people have to have that in them to be willing and want to do these kinds of things as well. It's like, it's a, it's a two way street for sure. Who you hire really matters. That's the most important thing I, I think. So that's like the core. And then those people are going to naturally form a culture. And if you hire the right people, they'll probably form a positive culture. Then the way I look at it as a leader, you can either amplify or dampen the culture. I love that. In this case, when you're promoting things like, yeah, like let's stop what we're doing and build this Easter egg. That's like amplifying the culture. You could have went the other way and said, no, we have a deadline to hit by Friday. We can't like lose an hour. That's kind of like dampening the culture. I'll give you one, one other example. I might've told this on the pod already, but I'll tell it again. In the same company, again, this is when I, I was more at the director level. Every time we close the deal, the salesperson would write an email to everyone in the company saying, Hey, we just closed this big deal. Here's how we won this deal. You know, thank you to, to the engineering team for delivering this feature. Thank you to, you know, Eric sales engineer, who I just talked about. And it was kind of like, uh, before the time that everyone in the company was on Slack. And so there was like a culture where you would reply plus one to this email thread and everyone in the company would kind of reply plus one, like hands up. Yay. We made a deal. And it was like, kind of like a joke that like with the CEO, like if you don't reply plus one, then you're not a team player. So the devs started joking about this. Oh, I guess I need to reply to the sales email with plus one. Otherwise the CEO won't think I'm a team player. So then I have someone on my team that says, can I automate our responses for the engineering team? So anytime in one of these emails comes in from sales, I have a script and it's just automatically going to plus one. Cause I want them to know, like we're all team players. And I was like, yeah, do that. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> the issue. So he, this person did it. his name was Bachman, Matt Bachman. Awesome guy. Super smart engineer used to work off of a mini trampoline while he was coding. And what? so he's bouncing on his trampoline, does his script. You no, literally bouncing on, a, on his literally on a trampoline. Yeah. Like a mini, like a mini trampoline, I know, but... like a small trampoline bouncing, developing, right? He writes the script. There's an issue with the script. The, <laughs> so the deal comes in big deal, hundred thousand dollar deal. And then there's hundreds of plus ones coming from Bachman replying to this email with everybody in the company on it. Plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, which is also funny that in itself. And I have to go, we had a cool CEO, but I had to go to the CEO and explain <laughs> why is there a hundred plus ones coming from Bachman? So I had to tell the whole story. But that's the thing, like, uh, as a, a leader, you gotta also, you know, when things get weird, stick up for your team and explain totally. the engineering culture. Totally. Thing. All right. I, maybe I got us a little off track with that story. Just Easter egg f after Easter egg. You have talked about or mentioned something around maybe a flat hierarchy culture. Yeah. What's up with the flat hierarchy or the concepts there? The concept is people are less fussed about having to talk to someone's boss and their boss's boss and their boss's boss's boss to get anything done or approved or reviewed or signed off. It's really about everyone's approachable. Talk to anybody you want and just honestly, just kind of you're, you're equal in terms of what you could contribute. 
it really is nice. Like I said, that's that's one of the reasons why I'm still here after 10 years. Like, you know, I worked at companies where the hierarchies were rigid and they were awful. Like you couldn't do anything interesting or innovative to how you approach solving for a project problem or having a client conversation. You get to ask for the right people to say, oh, it's okay. You know, here it's just like, if I want to reach out to a random partner or a random colleague somewhere in a country, I just do it. And if you ask them for permission, they'd be like, why are you asking me? I don't, I don't, I don't have time for this. You know what I mean? Everyone, the, the idea is to make everyone yeah. approachable. And it works like pretty well. It's a perfect no. Because you know, let's be very honest, right? You're still going to have some people that are much more senior, like no matter how flat the hierarchy, like I'm not just going to randomly email probably like Nick Suter, the CEO, I'm like, hey man, what's up? Let's talk about, you know, the last episode of Game of Thrones. Like, yeah, I know you have so much time on your hands to <laughs> talk about Game of Thrones. You know, right? let's talk about it. But yeah, it's it, in terms of like just being able to connect and collaborate and just get to know people. Just that, just that I love that. Just you should reach out to whoever you want and you just kind of do what you want to do and you just reduce the barriers, uh, reduce the points of friction, reduce the bureaucratic nonsense. Yeah. What it got me thinking is like, and so obviously you don't, want to be in a company that has too much hierarchy. There is always hierarchy that's going to exist. But if you're an engineering leader and you maybe, maybe you're new to the company and you now know, oh, there is like a hierarchy thing going on here. Do you have any tips of how to break that down so you can increase retention? Yeah, I feel like what really helps to set the tone it is actually, again, from the top where you make yourself seem like you're approachable. I think that I found that just to be wildly effective because otherwise people mm. were like, I know some people when they first started like, yeah, I just, I, I just, it's intimidating. I'm like, why? I'm like, I'm just a random moron. You know, I'm like, why are you being scared? Like, they're like, cause you're your, your title and you're like the head of engineering. I'm like, so if you, I found that you reach out first to people, whether they're established colleagues or they're like brand new hires to the engineering team. It just helps break that ice and it removes, I think, I, th I should say, alleviates some of that weird artificial distance that gets created with things like titles. So it does start to feel more like a flat hierarchy, yeah. you know what I mean? Because obviously there is a hierarchy, let's be very clear. Like, you know, someone that's a brand new engineer is not going to be able to make decisions that are strategic, you know, at the CTO level. But that's, that's not what the point of a flat hierarchy is. It's about approachability, empowerment, opportunities, and connectivity. And, you got to set the tone from the start. You have to be proactive. And it boils down to like you pulling others that are more junior to connect with you and talk with them and then engage with them, make them feel like their ideas are going to be listened to and included. And then the word just spreads, you know, like, oh yeah, go talk to Darren. Like, no, don't be weird. Like he's cool. You know, talk to Carolyn. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, but it has to be things that are already happening and then other people will follow suit. Because when people ask, like, hey, can I just can I talk to so and so? You have to have that answer, like, why are you asking me for permission, dude? Just talk to so and so. So it helps, you know what I mean? It starts one person at a time. Yeah, it spreads. People are, yes. uh, especially like individual contributors, will ask each other, should I go talk to Caroline? Is that weird? Is it normal? <laughs> no, it's normal. Do it. Okay, great. I know. Now, speaking of approachability, you have a story about your title on Slack. <laughs> your Slack. What's up with your Slack title? I love it. So I, I feel like titles are frustrating. They just, just ever since I, you know, I was green in my career, they just cause distance. Whether or not people intend it doesn't matter. Right. And so a while back early in my career, I was joking with somebody else. Um, we were just making up goofy titles. I forgot why. And he, he said, you can be a junior probationary intern, you know, and tell people that when they join, I'm like, oh, I love it. And so that just stuck. That was like from over 20 something years ago. So in Slack, because like I said, the more senior I get, I found like the more people just kind of like shy away. I told you like, I was a partner now. Oh my God. Like, no guys, I'm still the same. Oh, no. I was a year ago making fart jokes at the last offsite. Okay. I'm like pretty sure I'm the same person. <laughs> so, you know, just, I made that my title for a long time in Slack just because like people like would join in you and people they hear like, oh, you should talk to Carolyn. You know, she has engineering, whatever. She's a partner. And they'd look at my title and Slack. They'd be like, is this junior probation or inter? So people that also don't know me, I love it. They'd like, I just feel like they laugh because they're like, I love your title. So again, it's an icebreaker without you even having to say a word, you know? Yeah. That's what I was going to say. It is especially like a lot is going on on Slack now, remote work, that type of thing. It, yes. Probably you putting your title that way is like your outward expression of 
I don't have an ego that's like too big for you to come approach, basically. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's a signal. Like, I love you You're talking about that we're working in this new normal, right? This very, very remote, distributed, hybrid way of working. Every little thing you can do counts. Because we're big, we're like 5,000 people. I don't know how big y'all are, but like, it's 5,000 people, 5,000 plus. We're a little less than 5,000. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, we're not, we're not, not that big, but when, you know, people that are listening are, are working at all size companies. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot of people. It's a lot. Uh -huh. say, just every little thing that can count is like a, Hey, you can come talk to me. I'm the least like person, like the last person you're going to care about who's going to be like weird and dry and stoic. A lot of like the conversations with developers are over Slack. I mean, that's <laughs> like a reality. Not Skype for business. <laughs> Skype for business. No, I don't know any engineers. No, no, we used to use it. Then of course, like Microsoft parked it. Oh, like, really? Thank you. Oh yeah, it was awful. Okay. Like, they made me nostalgic for like using like instant messenger. Well, that's aim. I know. Yeah. That was like the golden era of chat, but that's an another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> what was your screen name? I had different ones. I used separate yeah. work and then personal ones. Um, what were your personal ones? If I can even remember, my my work one was just boring. It was like Bo nineteen seventy six. But then my friends <laughs> will just have to say they were like a little bit more, a uh, little bit more, a little bit more goofy. Where we're going with this in terms of like chat? I don't know if it's like chat etiquette or, but let's just say Slack in this example. If I'm on Slack all day or I'm like available to chat, does that make me more approachable to developers or like, what's your views on that? I think it's, it's not just about being set up with a status of, you know, just online, you got to do something with it. Right. And you can have, again, very passive or active interactions on Slack. You can set your away status if you're wanting to be heads down, but it could be something goofy, like building Skynet, leave me alone. You know, again, it could be a fun interaction without having to be something engaging necessarily directly. But if you're already being a more active, uh, engaged engineer with your team, it's just great to have a mix up of right. One-on-one -on -one, like direct messages, just quick feelers out there. Just like, Hey, how was yesterday? I heard something, you know, like was a bit bumpy or just, oh my gosh, you know, did you see that? Just little micro, um, engagements can be helpful to build relationships. And then of course, channel based, you know, relationships and conversations, you just have to be engaged in some way, shape or form, or else if you're just online, but you never respond, no one's going to care. Cause I'll be like, yeah, don't talk to Dan. He never responds to my messages. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. That would be a, a terrible feeling. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then I just think there's little fun tricks you can do to get people just engaged on a very, again, goofy level. Like you can just, I like to, I like to pop in with random, like guys, I'm bored. Here's a dad joke for you. You know what? I'm just popping up a random crappy dad joke. Do you think there's anything specific to like the, uh, behaviors of engineer or like the characteristics of a typical engineer that you can do to be more approachable for that type of person? Engineers are typically maybe not like if you thought of the difference between like a salesperson who is very outgoing, conversational, on calls, used to making random small talk. And typically it's not all the time. It's a little stereotyping, but typically engineers are a little bit more, okay, I'm zoned in, I'm focused, I'm a little more isolated. That type of personality is sometimes harder to to, I think, get that natural or like natural approachability or natural conversation going. So I was wondering, is there anything that's like specific to that personality type that you found works well for software developers? Yeah. For them, for them to just basically engage with the rest of the community. So they feel like they are not just an island of one kind of a thing. Yeah. Or, or to engage with, with a manager. Like I, I'll give you an example. I had something that, that came to mind that we talked a little bit before in the podcast with some of the engineers that had reported to me, it was harder to get to know them or even like make myself approachable kind of due to that characteristic of a little more heads down. I'm, I'm doing my work. I'm isolated. I'm still creating and stuff. And what I found for them is like, when I would reach out to them, the best like icebreaker would be, 
hey, I saw you were working in this piece of the code <laughs> or something like that. How is that going for you? What yeah. are the areas that are going well, not going well? So something that was like really technical in their area of work was a way that I found to kind of break the ice and then get a conversation going. Yeah. Um, was the best approach for me. There, I just like, there's no, there's not going to be a best approach. Everyone is so different, unique. And just because you're an introvert doesn't mean that you only want to talk about code stuff. You know I mean, some people love talking about gaming or Legos and stuff like that. I feel like as a leader, you have to constantly put yourself out there and engage again, either in the group setting or like one-on-ones and just try things until something sticks. It just, it, it's very challenging because some people are, are right. uncomfortable making small talk. And if you find that initial segue being talking about, Hey, I saw you were in this part of the code, just getting them to even engage within dialogue is that first step for them versus people that may be yeah. more outgoing and you can just talk about something off the bat and they just always, you know, jump on something proactively. Everyone's yeah. just got such a exactly. different style, right? I think it's a bad point about, I, cause I know I, I deal with some engineers who are also very much more reserved and much more introverted, right? And they're, they're really wanting to be focused on the work at hand, the code at hand, but they also still like to have fun. At the end of the day, I think it's just, you get to get it out of them more. It just takes more effort, getting to know them, what makes them excited. And then once you get that look in, it's like the rest you can just keep running with. It's just find that initial hook. Like what are they doing their weekends? You know, again, that takes time from leadership to have to, to, to make the time, right? To have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Cause if you don't, they're going to stay off in like a remote part of Slack that you'll never hear from. Yeah. Two things that always work, talk about the code, talk about the thing that they're working on and, or gaming, <laughs> gaming always works. <laughs> what are you playing? It's like yeah. the best question that you could possibly ask. I mean, what, you know, what, um, I mean, we have a bunch of channels that are actually great. Like I tell new joiners, I'm like in their Trello onboarding card. I'll have like, here's some interesting channels you might find fun and relevant to you. So we'll have channels around gaming board games, Legos, chess, so you, food, you, you know, pets, you throw out a bunch of predefined community-based channels. And at some point, those people are going to gravitate towards what they see as a topic. And then boom, you instantly have a way that you can further engage with them and further connect with them. As we're coming up to the end of the pod here, is there one last bit of advice that you'd like to give the audience around creating a culture that improves retention rates? I think so. I'd recommend you give engineers multiple safe platforms and multiple safe channels to be heard. I'm not talking about Slack channels. I'm talking about whether it's a Zoom conversation, a one-on-one -on -one Slack, um, an ask me anything format, whatever they want to have, give them multiple safe channels and platforms to just talk about what's on top of mind for them. Um, and don't just listen to what they're saying. Like try to do something about it too. If you don't action on anything, right, it feels a bit futile. And then empower the engineers and support them. And don't forget to challenge them. Engineers like to be challenged, right? They don't want to work with like COBOL until they die, right? It's like, it's really about fueling what drives and motivates them. And that's why it's all part of like taking a cap in what's next story, right? Giving them a chance for communication and being heard. I, I just can't emphasize enough. Like you show that you listen to them if you do something about the things that they're talking to you about. So if we're talking about like, I want to be able to do these things as part of my next story, and then you make it happen, retention, because guess what? They like, they're like, they're at a place where they're being listened to and what they need is being actioned on and being realized, right? Or if they're having struggles with like problems in their team, you do something about that, right? When you fix the, the challenges and conflicts, it's just listen to people and then do something about it. Don't just give them an ear, be proactive and do something about it. Well, Carolyn, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and helping us retain our amazing engineers. It's been an awesome conversation. Thanks for having me. I really had a good time and I'm looking forward to the next invite to talk about Easter eggs that we may or may not get fired for. Absolutely. That, that is definitely going to be the next pod. Um, Carolyn, I know that you're really into charity and there's a few of them that you want to mention for people to donate to. I would love people to just take a minute and think about what charities they could donate, like just $25 to even like go to Kiva, find someone you can learn and make a micro loan to, right? Go to like doctors without borders. They can really use your help right now. 
I feel like when people think about donating, they sometimes get stressed out. Maybe they're struggling with money and I get that, right? But donations don't have to be some grandiose gesture. They can be, again, 25 bucks to like your local pet shelter, right? A logo can go a long way. Amazing. Yeah. So like Carolyn said, like even a small amount, maybe this weekend, think about a charity that you can donate to even 25 bucks really, really helps. Um, I also want to say thank you to more than the 3000 of you who are now subscribed to our weekly interruption newsletter. We bring you articles from the community, inside information on weekly podcasts, and the first look at Interact 3.0 on October 25th. Interact is awesome. If you haven't been there already, highly, highly recommended to attend. It's a ton of fun. It's free. It's online and you can register today. And Carolyn, thank you again for coming on the pod. Thanks so much, Dan. Thanks all for having me. Have a good weekend.